All right, everybody, the Jerry Metcalf podcast where top real estate agents tell how they do it. Today, we have a long lost friend of mine, Jorge Ribe from One Sotheby's International Realty in Miami. You specialize in a lot of waterfront properties. Pretty much waterfront properties all throughout South Florida. So I'm one of the few agents that does um, not like these micro markets like Miami Beach only, Key Biscayne only. I kind of do the whole gamma. So that's how I, I specialize in waterfront, but I do do others. But my name's been known for the, the really big waterfront sales here. So I'm going to make note, everybody, notice how humble he is. He's only been the top agent in the city of Miami or in Miami. He's only been a top agent multiple times. You probably, I mean, I think you've been like ranked at number, up there towards number 32 or higher in the country. By the few, yeah, some good years, some not so good years, some good years. But yeah, all in all, it's been a great, great uh, run at it for sure. You know, right. fun with it. I try right. not to get too obsessed with numbers. I have fun with it, you know, and some of these, Sometimes it's not fair because you'll have some of these years that you'll double double end a fifty million dollar deal, and it just looks like you just sold a hundred million like that, and then and then to try to get to a hundred million, two million at a time takes a while, <laughs> you know. So Greg always going to say it takes a while to even get to that place and that level. Yeah, sure. So, like, tell us, you know, I want to talk about how you got into business, but let's not miss out on negotiating a fifty million dollar deal and working with your clients and what your secret sauce is. But let's do start with. How and why did you become a real estate agent? Yeah, purely by accident. Because I mean, my background was more finance and accounting. And um, lo and behold, I found myself a um, couple of years unemployed in the early 2000s. After, that was in the, after the dot-com internet boom. That was like the last thing. Um, but it was awesome, actually. And, and I, I really say thanks to my wife because I got into real estate because of her. Um, because the hardest thing usually for our, I want to say a high performing agent for someone with um, a certain background, let's say to get into real estate, it takes a while because you, you'll, you'll eat, you know, doo doo for a couple of years by the time you make your first client, make your first, it, there's a big curve in the beginning to get any kind of money. So I was actually blessed that my wife had a corporate job. So she was actually paying the bills. So I could jump into when I got the opportunity to meet this guy, Carlos Husto, which is a super famous Superstar guy. He was like Robin Leach, uh, last of the rich and famous show and this whole thing. Rosie O'Donnell and the whole thing. So I started working with him and it was funny because I met the CFO at a barbecue, um, his, his partner, let's say, and he had gone to school with Jeanette. Purely like life is awesome in a sense of how sometimes you're at the right place, right time. I met them at this birthday party. I didn't want to go to and He's like, Hey, Jorge, do you want to get into real estate? And I'm like, I, I don't know anything about real estate. He's like, oh, I, I work wait, with Carlos, wait, wait, slow down. So Carlos yeah. said, hey, no, Jorge, do you want guy, to get into Irving, Irving Padron was a guy who okay. worked for Carlos, who went to school with my wife, Jeanette. And we met into okay. a birthday party, and he was trying to start this new concept. And the concept was um, he wanted to take over the entire market in a team scenario. It didn't really exist in Miami. He wanted to get eight super agents, None of them from real estate. He wanted to hire lawyers, bankers, ex-finance people, create a team of professionals, and then divide the entire market by this. And I'm like, so he said like, hey, why don't you show up on Monday to the office? And I showed up and it was absolutely just mind blowing. Because I came from a corporate background and I show up and here's this like bold little dude in pajamas meditating with the team around the table. Like they're all humming away. And I'm like, what is this? It, it looked like a cult because Carlos always wore this like white pajamas, like linen outfits, almost like right. a, one of those like guru guys. So anyway, yeah. at the end of the day, long story, I don't want to bore you with the story, but it's not it's kind boring. Of, yeah, it was kind of like hilarious. So, but he had something going. He had some really great lessons in life that I could take it. Well, you got to take us back because you meet your first, you got to take us there for a minute. So you go to a party, you meet a member of Carlos. Yeah, a member of Carlos who's so excited. And was it Irvin or what was Irvin Padron? And he says, Hey, you want to get into real estate? We're recruiting. To make You're in their office work. and they're like meditating. And so I'm like, okay, go to the office. And when I showed up to the office, here's this group of like six guys sitting around a circle on the floor with one of those, like, you ever see those, like the, the bowls that you, um, like you, it makes this bowl, like, it makes like a humming noise, like doom. Yes, yeah, so and it's the pottery. Yeah, everybody's going around. Sure like, She's a big man. Everybody's going around yeah. with this, with this like Buddhist humming sound with their eyes shut, basically meditating. And then they all went around the room saying, like, 
what are you grateful for, Ralph? What are you grateful for? And then they went around and then I was like, are they, Jorge, oh, you knew. Oh, what are you grateful for? And it was just like, you know, so it was just funny as hell. Just what like, were you grateful totally, for? I mean, what I was blown away. For? I was like, I mean, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be alive. Right. It was like, anyways, it was funny. So pretty high performing. I mean, a lot of really good lessons about it. I mean, if anything I could say about Carlos was um, yeah. what I talked earlier about you, there's a couple things. I mean, I think one of the most important things that can really, I think, blow anybody away with, I, I guess, is whether you're in real estate or whether you're in any service industry, right? Whether you're selling shoes or a waiter or a sommelier or a realtor, is right. know, know your subject, know your things. Know, and what are we selling? We're selling real estate. So Carlos was an absolute genius. I mean, he was gifted in memory. So the guy knew every single house in Miami from size of lot, who built it, who designed it, who lived it. He, he could go back for transactions. Like he'd be like, that house sold in 1960 to so-and-so, then sold, so 10 years later, flipped it to so-and-so, and then so-and-so did this and then sold it to so-and-so. And it was just like, whoa. Um, I'm wow. not, I'm not as gifted, so I have to work at it a little bit more as far as like learning constantly, you know, studying the market, studying the market, studying the market, because ultimately we get paid to be advisors. And the only way you can be a true advisor is if you really know your shit. I mean, you really need to understand the market no matter where you are. And it's mind blowing. You can be at a, at a guy at, you know, I, you could say the same thing about a bank or a lawyer, right? A lawyer that really knows his, right. yeah. Sorry, did I say? Yeah, I'm just word? listening. Did I did I say the SIG? SIG? No. Oh, you Am I allowed to say rude words? We're or? not on the radio, okay. and even in even in Atlanta, even in the South, we're okay with it. Oh, so, so, um, so, um, but so going like, and we're going to transition into yeah. now. So you yeah, went we'll, we'll you came out of kind of a corporate environment, right? Yes, I, I came. I came. I mean, I studied accounting, and I worked in general management. I ran a company. I'm up. The Carrier Corporation, part of United Technologies, I ran their company in Chile for five years. So I was right. there, I was their oh, wow. manager. So I actually went to Chile, opened up the operations. And then from there, I transitioned to two internet startups. So I had a really good, let's say, um, corporate career. Um, yeah. Successful, did well, enjoyed it. But I found myself unemployed, but it's okay. I was taking care of my kids. That well, I was the best because now I was, yeah, I was Mr. Mom. I was Mr. Mom for two years and it was awesome. I, that's like today, my son's 22, my daughter's 21. And we have probably a pretty cool relationship because I was there taking them to school and all the men hated wow. me because I was at the, at the, at the, like at the preschool, like working on projects. And then the moms yeah. would be like, why can't you be like Jorge? And he's like, because Jorge doesn't have a job. <laughs> you know? Anyway, no, I was kidding. But it's, <laughs> I was not. I was not the favorite in the men department because I was like they all. All the wives thought I was cool because I. So you go myself. in from the, like the corporate <laughs> world to the meditating, the meditating realtors yeah. on reality TV. By the way, yeah. well, what about like actually like breaking into this and getting your first deal? Like, how did that all come together, and what did that look like? Um, a little bit of luck in reality. So the way Carlos did it, the way he divided our, our, our team is we actually, it was again, super high performance. So for example, I was in charge of a neighborhood called Gables Estates, which is kind of like Core Gables waterfront expensive. Mm -hmm. Ralph got Indian Creek. So-and-so got uh, North Bay Road and um, Star Island. And what we would do, we would actually have to, let's say, understand the market really, really well. And then we actually had to pitch the team about everything we learned about the neighborhood. So every so often I would have to present to my team, Carlos included, about, so I would have this map that I did back then. It was, you know, a lot of, like, let's say almost like a PowerPoint where I said, here's Gables to State. There's 171 houses. It was founded in 1950s, so 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 These are the 10 homes that are there now. These are the 10, whatever. I know so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Uh, so I started to prove myself that I was the team member in charge of this. Now, what would happen over time, which is actually pretty nerve wracking, is that if if there was a listing that was going to, if a listing showed up on the MLS and I hadn't talked about it, I would get like strike one. They'd be like, how come you never spoke to that lady? How come you didn't know it was going to be for sale? Oh. So you would actually lose your neighborhood to the team if you proved that. And now, if you said, well, I talked to her, but she didn't like me, different story. At least you got in and you had the chance to present. But you've got to bring her up before. That yeah, so you got to bring her up before okay. and you had to know every single person that were, how long they lived there, how many kids, were they grown up, were they not? 
So it was a and that's 171 high- houses? Like you had to know every single yeah, one? Yeah, so every single one. Wow. And then it started expanding. You started taking over. And then we also had something which actually I think is something brilliant for realtors. And I've kind of talked about it before in some other chats. Uh, it was something called, it's really accountability to yourself. But the problem with real estate is that we're not, we're all single agents, free agents, and the mind plays funny tricks on you. And it's hard to be truly accountable to yourself. So it's accounting every single minute, accounting every single hour. What exactly are you doing? I mean, are you, how many times are you making a photocopy? If you go into the photocopy, you're 20 times. Why don't you get a freaking machine in your desk and save those five minutes? Are you going on a smoke break? Are you going whatever? So really accounting. But so one is time accountability to yourself of how productive you're being because life will, we're in a dangerous job, not dangerous job, but we're in a dangerous job for our egos. And that's when we go into the yeah. whole mental thing. Rejection yeah. is not something that the mind likes. Uncertainty is something that the mind doesn't like. So you will avoid making that phone call, that cold call to that one person by staying busy doing other crap. <laughs> you know, just because you don't yeah. want to be faced with rejection. You don't want to be faced with uncertainty. You know, so, yeah. so you tend to stay busy doing stuff. Oh, I worked my ass off today. I did all this stuff. But you haven't had to make make that call, make the hard call, take the chance that maybe they hang up the phone. You're like, you know, it's, it's ultimately back then it was cold calling. It was like, I cold call my, I, I door knocked, I cold called. So anyways, I mean, to step back, what yeah, Carlos did, which is, something yeah. that, which is something that's really valuable, is we had something called the sales engine, uh, Jerry, which was basically yeah. every day we had a sales meeting at 7.30 in the morning, early in the morning. We did a little meditation. We did a little presentation. And then we ran around the room and you basically had to say to the team, um, yesterday I made this many calls. I set up this many appointments. I attended this many appointments. And then these are the deals I'm working on. And each deal had a stage. So remember a deal, whether you're negotiating a contract or you're trying to negotiate a potential listing, you had, um, you're in like present, negotiate, you know, so those steps that you would have to take. So you basically have to report. Now, this is all an honor system, obviously. You could go out there and say, well, I made 100 calls. No, you have to go out there. So every once in a while, you'd be like, you report to the team. Listen, I had an off day. I only made 10 calls uh, and I didn't attend any appointments. So it was all about, really, it was creating the funnel. Where's my camera? The funnel. Uh, the funnel right. is we're in a statistical thing. You make, you know, it's whether it's 100 emails or 100 phone calls ends up with 10 potential listings or 10 potential leads that end up being one potential client. So it's all about volume of calls, door knocking, et cetera. If you don't make the numbers, you don't get the leads, you don't get the sales. But what, like, what a paradox or dichotomy, or I don't know, yeah. the, because you've got this environment where you've got these people who are, you know, we talked about that. Super, um, yeah. And then you've got like, did you make your calls? You weren't there. You didn't know they were going to list. Why didn't you know about them? You're out. Yeah, so it was, but a lot of it was just, so right. it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, definitely it was a, it was a, 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 it wasn't a parent child, but it was a constructive, constructive criticism. He was really just, this guy was downloading his, his recipe of success. He was a very, probably the number one real, number one realtor. Sadly, you know, personal issues happened in, in the recession and, and he ended up imploding. But for 30 years, this guy was the number one agent in Miami. I mean, Carlos used to control everything. Mm-hmm. Celebrities, Gloria Stefan, he was with Robin Leach and the lives. I mean, Rosie O'Donnell, I mean, he, every, he sold all the big houses and there was no one else. Now, I don't know if in, in Atlanta, the same thing in, you know, 20 years ago, there was just a handful, two, three people that controlled the high end. Now in Miami, seriously, oof, there's probably 50, 60 agents that control so the is- 5 million and above. Exactly. So you've got. So the competition level has really kind of elevated. So now it's a- there aren't enough. There aren't that many 50, 60 million dollar listings. There is, yeah. So, so it's really, yeah. At all. But right. there's one and it sold for eight million. But yeah, so a- nobody, but it's the same thing. I mean, whether but, it's or eight or nine, it's ultimately the same. Right. It's the same, it's the same echelon but, but, of, of high school. Let's touch on that though, because yeah. you said like at that time there were two or three controlling that whole market, and now they're yeah. 50 or 60. What was what what changed? I think um one, there was an influx of of um this luxury brands, you know, whether it was, remember Sotheby's really didn't exist. And now Sotheby's came along. We were the first Sotheby's franchise. Mm-hmm. Carlos bought, he bought sole Sotheby's and later on ended up being one Sotheby's. 
but Douglas Elliman didn't exist. Corcoran didn't exist. You know, Compass obviously didn't exist. There wasn't all these like luxury right. brands. It was just like Como Banker and like Keller Williams. And like, there was just like a, a few little like funny, like and it wasn't like, maybe it was like the, the fact that reality shows hadn't started and everybody wants to be a freaking realtor now. That makes like, a difference, well, like, right? You know, back then it was like, just a few people were realtors. Now it's like, there's serious people jumping ship from corporate into real estate because one, if you do well, the money's crazy. I mean, you can have years that you can make, you know, million, two million, three million dollars that, you know, in corporate, when I worked as a country freaking director in Chile, working 60 hours a week, I was making $120,000 a year salary with maybe a $20,000 bonus. Now you can do that in one deal, one little deal, you know, it's like, so that's also attracted a lot of people that, that are somehow coming from other industries. So there has been a big influx of, 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 of serious competition and it's getting kind of ugly out there. And that's where we can talk a little bit about, um, I guess, keeping your head cool, keeping your, your composure throughout this whole thing, because it is, it is an ugly, not an ugly, it's, 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 a, it's a tough market out there for, for competition. Um, even Sotheby's now, you know, when I first started with Ra, I mean, with, with Carlos, we were eight Sotheby's agents. Now we're like 900 mm-hmm. agents, right? So in theory, Wait, how many is 900 you said now? 900, yeah, yeah. 901 Sotheby's. So in theory, you know, I could show up to a listing presentation and there could be 30 other Sotheby's agents, one Sotheby's agents with exactly the same, you know, listing presentation. So what's going to separate you? You know, and what separate and to that, what separates you? So what, I think what really separates me is like, if I was to say one thing, one would be knowledge um, for sure, because I am, I don't say I'm the only one, but I am religiously today still showing up to the office eight o'clock in the morning every day. And I spend at least an hour and a half. That was also part of the Carlos Gusto indoctrination, you know, organize your day. The perfect day should be from eight, you know, one you know, eat well, be healthy, or, you know, exercise. You have to be a mental and physical good condition. You can't be, you know, just, you know, well, there's shape physical, and physical, mental, you physical know. mental, spiritual. You know, so f- physical, mental, spiritual, so that. And then organize your day. Don't start scheduling appointments at 9 a.m. for showing. No, you control your day because you have to have two, three hours at the beginning of the day to organize your day. Make the calls, follow up, et cetera. Then start showings and meetings after in the afternoon. 11 o'clock in the morning afterwards. So you really have to do that. So I get in the morning and I go through the entire market, whether it's MLS and I go to the tax roll and I'm constantly reminding myself and studying like this household. Wow, that's interesting. Why didn't I know about it? What did, how long did it sell for? How long was it in the market for? Uh, I go into the tax roll. I look at the aerial picture. I look at Google Earth. I understand it. Every time there's an open house, I go to every single open house just to, not to have free lunch. I go to the open house to know the neighborhood, know the everything. So that's number one power. And number one, it would be knowledge. Number two, honestly, is something that I bring back with Carlos is really just have, um, and I don't know if it's my, it wasn't just Carlos. I was always like that. I am really unattached to money. I don't really care there. I'm a very simple, humble person. I don't have a fancy watch on. I drive a 1974 International Scout. That's my daily drive. I drive an old car. You know, it's like, I don't have a Ferrari. I don't have a- As long as it runs well. Because, like, no, you know. it's just, I think it's cool. It's just like, whatever. But it's like, but there's also one thing is like, in this business, unattached to the outcome is something that's hugely important, especially when you work the big leagues. The big leagues being like, if you're working with a hedge fund guy, if you're working with a guy who's worth 100 million, 300 million, a billion dollars, these guys are used to smelling out rats. They smell people that are sales guys. They smell commission breath two miles away. I mean, they know these guys are just sales guys. Well, so, we always, yeah, they're looking, they want to be able to trust you and they want yeah. to know that you're listening. But the reason they trust you is because they have to truly believe and your body language has to truly portray. And you can't fake that. that. You don't care about the commission. That commission for me, that deal, that $20 million deal, as nice as it sounds, like half a million dollars is not going to put my kids through school. I don't need that deal to pay for my mortgage. You should have your house paid for. Your car should be paid for. Your education should be paid for. Because if you if you need that deal to make the mortgage payment, if you need that deal to pay for your second Ferrari, if you need, you, there is no way you can mentally detach yourself from that. And that, and, that will, and that is what will destroy you and destroy so many people. Hundred percent. So you, it's it's this business is so dangerous because 
versus corporate when I worked before that every month, you know, you got your $10,000, you know, check every right. five, two weeks and you knew how to plan here. All of a sudden you have two, three months of great bonanza check for 300 grand, 200 grand, 50 grand, 80 grand. All of a sudden you think you're the cat's meow and you're going to the Porsche dealer, uh -huh. ordering a big one, buying yourself a new boat. And all of a sudden, guess what? This business is cyclical. All of a sudden you're like, holy shit. You know, it dries off and you're like, I've now got three of these payments, a boat payment, a car payment. You know, you're like, ah. no way and there's no way physically, I don't think physically and mentally, I don't think you can detach yourself That's from the next deal. Point. You will smell like commission for the next deal. Yeah. A couple of things. I want to repeat what you said so yeah. everybody gets like the whole concept because I'm taking notes and bullet pointing. Yeah. Because sometimes you don't even know what you're saying and then like yeah. pull it out of you. But first of all, like, on that detachment, so many people go, oh, go just go buy yourself a house so you have something to work for so you have to show up. That's the wrong way to show up, first of all. You got to show up for you, not for anybody or anything else. Right. Um, I mean, what great advice. But then the things, like you, you talked about knowledge, mm -hmm. but know your market, not like kind of, but like size of the lot, where it is, what it's sold for, what the history is, how old it is, what's right, like everything you could possibly know. Know your market, yep. that, that's your value. The next thing is you didn't really say this, but you talked about your habits, like your habits and your schedule. Every single day you get up, you learn the market. Your mornings are planning your day, learning your market, making your calls, engaging follow up emails, follow up like emails. Your afternoons are meetings then meetings, appointments. Yeah. Appointment. You, have to go, you have to go talk, and it's and it's all based on. Um, I did it a little bit different, and I'm and I'm, and it's like I'm sorry if I scatter in conversation, but. We talked a little bit about the, um, you know, the unattachment, the good advice, and the only way you can physically, and then they will, you can think you're really smart and say like, I'm not going to tell them that I really care for this commission. Your body language cares for the commission. Oh, yeah. Also, and also be, be unattached to the people. I mean, I've said this story before, which is actually a funny, not a funny story, but yeah. I've worked with buyers and I don't call them buyers. I work with people that are potentially thinking about maybe making an acquisition. You kind of use that language to detach yourself from it because Miami is a place that a lot of people show up and they're rich and they can buy Miami, they can buy Aspen, they can buy New York, they can buy Paris. And it's just a place they come to consider potentially buying. So if you go around thinking, I got this buyer, I'm going to go with this buyer, I'm going to go with this buyer, you spend a week with the guy. Oh, you're going to buy. And then, and then yeah. all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, like the last day, you, you, you sense that he's not buying and you go into shutdown mode because you've gone around in your head thinking like, this guy's a $10 million guy. This is a $300,000 commission, $300,000 commission. And all of a sudden the guy's like, I don't think I found anything. And at that point, there's two, two forks on the road. You can take the holy like, ah, and then your body language goes into like, oh, you disappointed me. You wasted my time, body language with the guy. Or you like take the high road and you're like, it was so awesome meeting you. And you drive him to the airport and you give him a hug and then you wish him well. And you say, listen, you know, next time we're in Miami, hook me up or make sure you tell your friends about me because I'll tell you that's what you want. So, and, and they sense that. If they sense that. So usually what I do from the get-go, Jared, which is funny, is like when I work with an out-of-towner, there's two things that I've done to disarm. Usually I say from the get-go, I say, listen, I will spend as much time as you want and I don't really care whether you buy. That's number one. So I, I lay the ground. Yeah, for the guy. Great. He's yeah. like, I don't, I don't, I'm just here to service you. I'm here to educate you. And more than likely the answer would be like, Miami's not for me and it's okay. So don't ever feel bad for me that you're wasting my time because ultimately I'm here to serve. You. I'm here to serve. I'm here to educate you. And the answer at the end of the week or two weeks or a month could be Miami's not for me. And it happens. I would say at least 50, 60% of the times that I've shown buyers, nothing happens. They don't buy Miami. So, I, keep on. No, so these are the guys that if you treat them well, they will send you referrals. Next time they're in New York or wherever, and they're like, they hear a buddy at a cocktail party saying, hey, I'm thinking of Miami. You're like, oh my God, you got to call my buddy Jorge. My Jorge, let me, let me pass you his number. Yeah, your buddies, because that's the frame of mind that because you that's what, truly that's what you want with an agenda. Yeah. You want uh, this 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 guy who's just going to treat you well and have fun and knows the market really well and who doesn't really care whether you buy or not. Who's not going to like be the typical realtor. You're going to put an offer? Yeah. I, I have never, Jerry, I've never said the words, do you like it? Or are you going to put an offer on that one? It doesn't come my mouth. I do. Right. It's just gross. That yeah. shit has never come out of my mouth. It's just like, I've never yeah. said, you want to put an offer on that one? Do you like it? You want to put an offer? Oh, and that just it's makes, like, it's just like, talk about the no, whole but You know how many people say that? It's like, so I just, I just show, 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 show. Wow. And I just drop them off and I, and I figure 
listen, if they like it, they'll call okay. me. Be like, I like that one. You should. Love that. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that that you can say. Um, on one, don't give up on buyers. One of the, my biggest deals that kind of broke my career was a uh, uh, forty nine million dollar deal um, that mm-hmm. I presented both sides. But this buyer in particular came to Miami for seven years. He would come every year. He would say like, Jorge, I'm flying in. Can you show me some stuff? Pick yeah. the guy up, drive him around, show him four or five homes, drop him back at the hotel. And I'd be like, see ya. I never said once like, hey, do you like this one? What do you think? Hey, you know. and the guy every year would call me. I actually, I would just like, what? Don't bother rich people. Don't freaking email them every single price reduction, every single, no. every single post about me with my kids or whatever. No, or, or, the, or how great I am. I don't email my clients, especially the really important ones, more than once a year. You kind of leave them alone. It's kind of like a reminder because they're really busy people. You don't want to be like every single price reduction, open house. Every time I sell something, I sold, I sold, I'm great, I'm great. I'm great. So, so for seven years, the guy would come by every year. He would come by every year, come by. And then the last year, I showed him this one house and he's like, I like this one. Let's put an offer on it. Okay, so you're was, lean in a little bit or shift your computer back. Cause like, there you go. And I'll talk again. Cause it echoes. Yeah. No, I'm saying like after, after, right after there. all, these, good, yeah, after yeah, all these years, yeah. after seven years, you know, of coming every year, showing three, four houses. So I was in a sense. Now what price point was that one? Remember? This was 49 million. Right. I mean, 50 million dollar deal. Back then the most expensive house ever sold in Miami was 22. So this was like double. Uh, you like average, more than average. double the average sales price. It was, it was like a holy. Right. So another thing about that, yeah. like, because there's so much focus on like how to get them to buy, how to get the deal, follow up, follow up, follow up. Yeah. It's build rapport, build, inte- build integrity, build trust, make sure they know you're listening and you care about them. Mm-hmm. And also like it t- took me way too long in business to figure these things out. But you've got a buyer like that, you're learning the market. You're learning and seeing things in a capacity that you will never have. You will very rarely yeah, exactly. have the capacity yeah, to otherwise like harness it. Because if it's not this one, it's going to be one. Exactly. It's it, 100%. It's a blessing because every year I would actually get some really good kudos. So the worst thing that could happen, obviously, is he doesn't buy. But the best thing that happened is that three or four of the sellers that had these houses that were off market or on the market knew that Jorge Uribe was coming by with, this guy was a significant guy, obviously. He's one of, you know, one of those billionaire guys, right. et cetera. So he, they, they kind of knew that my clients that I was bringing by were very qualified. Now, whether they bought it or not, they saw me coming in through their house door with a guy that they knew who it was. And they're like, holy shit, this guy's, you know, he's got some good clients. Exactly. So it, it definitely helped my reputation with potential future listings because they always knew that Jorge was, and for what you're saying, the knowledge of, I knew these houses now more intimately because I went to show them to this guy. Now, don't don't show up with fake buyers to try to do that because yeah. it's not very, it's not, that's right. not very, integrity is, is important, obviously. Exactly. When people go around with fake buyers. So exactly. that was one of the lessons is like, don't give up on people, be unattached. Many times, Jerry, also what I've done in the past with these guys, from the get-go, I've actually talked them out of buying and I've talked them into renting. Uh, and that's also a little tactic, a little trick that's actually pretty cool. Uh, it's dangerous yeah. and you don't get paid, but you get paid on year two or three so when, you know it's when right. they buy. Yeah. But when you tell them, yeah. he's like, listen, I'm not, um, maybe you should rent for a year or two and understand Miami and see if something that you like. Now, two things happen. They say, okay, great, they rent. Or two, they say, no, we want to buy anyways. But by you saying that, it showed them that you didn't care about the commission on the sale. That because yeah. they know rental commissions are, you know, a fraction of a sale commission. Right. Well, so that was also a, something that I've always done with, with, with out of towners is I usually recommend, why don't you guys just rent, find a nice rental and understand the market. See if you even like Miami before you buy. But having that conversation gets out for them, for that, for you, but also for themselves. Like something like these people don't know, about, guys, what if you rent it? Because not only it's not about like, like you said, detached from the outcome, it's yeah. like getting them to talk about what's really important. Mm-hmm. And that even mm-hmm. helps them know when they hear their own answer, it helps yeah. them know where they stand. Yeah, that you're worried about so them, that you don't want them to make a financial yeah. commitment before they even know the Miami well, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so that's also some, another little lesson that, you know, just be with, you know, with integrity, be with uh, unattached to the outcome. 
be in a healthy financial yeah. place. We talked about it earlier, like my house is paid for, right? So I don't have a mortgage. I don't have a car payment. Right. I don't have my only so obligation in my life. Hmm? Yeah. No, yeah my ahead, only, my only obligation in reality is my kids' education. I send them to the best schools and I'm happy to. And that's, that's, you know, it's a big commitment. My son went to, you know, university in London. My daughter's in Boston. It's pricey, but that's for me, that's my luxury to send my kids to as best schools as they can afford, knowing that they'll never have a student loan. My dad did it to me. I'm giving it, you know, I'm paying it forward to them, you know, with the, with the future, but I don't have a car payment. So I can actually stop working for, and they, they sense that. The, and that's why I, I, I'm trying to emphasize that the wealthier the clients the more sensitive and the more trained they are at smelling rat because rich oh, and people, it's not, they're not even like, they're not like trained. They're just used to it. So I'm going to, they're just used to it. They're used to blood sucking leeches all their lives from everybody just trying to get something out of them. Exactly. So, like, so, so this too, I want to repeat this for everybody to like stand track of what you're saying. You're talking yeah. about like know your market, have yeah. your habits to know your market, deliver to your clients to be there. And number three, like you literally went out of habits and pivoted into the last thing that you talked about, which is really where you're coming in is your mind. Yep. Like you can't like faint this stuff. Meditation is yep. great, but what's in there is coming out. So it better be some good stuff. Like <laughs> exactly. it helps yeah. whatever you, I mean, do, you get there and serve people. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, no, so I mean like, uh, you know, the reality is that, you know, we're hopefully superstar athletes, but you really what our main muscle is our mind and our conversation and our ability to listen and our ability to interpret what people want you to say. Sometimes they'll tell you something completely opposite and you can sense that they're just saying it, but you know better. Um, so it's one of those that our mind is something that uh, everybody should practice, whether it's meditation, whatever works for you to just, because it's amazing the amount of garbage that our minds have in them. Uh, and whether it's, I mean, Carlos made everybody go to Landmark, Landmark Education, I mean, some people think it's a cult or it's frou-frou. It was all landmark, basically. It was all based on, and everybody can research it, but it's, it's they have all around the world. It's based on something called completing your past. Completing, completing your, past, your was, past. Completing your past was getting rid of emotional crap and baggage that no matter how good you think your life is, everybody's got some emotional baggage about your dad said something to you when you were eight who said you're never going to be anything Jorge and you carry that shit around some sort of an ego thing so it really kind of helps you let's say cleanse the garbage that's there so that's number uh -huh. one so landmark is everybody should have because ultimately we are high performing agents but we don't throw a ball we don't hit a bat we don't hit the, the only thing that's going to make you high performance is your mind and what you do with it Mind is knowledge, mind is an attachment, mind is listening, mind is, what is it? Yeah. it knowing how to, oh, I took a negotiating class. No, it does, that's not mind. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, I took this, you know, realtor, uh, the realtor well, board had, um, had a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a certified right. relocation specialist. I mean, like, I'm like. like right, no, 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 no. But I will say, yeah. I say it a lot on this show, never split the difference, Chris Voss. Yeah. That's a mind, that's a mind. It is. It is, so, I mean, but, but let's, I want to repeat what you said for everybody again, knowledge have its mind. And in your mind, it is actually like peeling back your own layers of bullshit so that you see your own bullshit, because until you see your own bullshit, you won't really see other people's bullshit. And when you can't see other people's bullshit, you can't really listen and hear what they need and want. And not only like, not, not like what they think they want uh -huh. and what they think they need, but what they really do to get to the end of the day and, or get to that deal and get to where everybody needs to be for what is the best thing, not just like hoping you make a deal and get lucky. That's just playing the lottery, which isn't really a very strong. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No. And, and then, and then funny enough, the, the, um, it gets more and more complicated the higher you go in the price point. Because I mean, the, you know, if, if it's a nice couple, you know, out of college and they're buying their starter home, they're not playing main games with you. They're not this, you know, they just want the, you need to present their home and it's nice. You show them some good comps and you can pretty much get the deal done. But when you start talking about a guy that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever, they start playing games with you. I mean, it's all about like, blah. so it's like, I, I mean, I almost treat them like they're children. You know, you take the candy away. Like I've never called, um, you know, you being direct with them. And then you're like, the worst thing for one of these guys to say is like, listen, I guess, you know, this house is not for you. <laughs> you know, it's whatever. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Like, what do you mean it's not for me? Or whatever. Like, you know, so you, 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 
No, keep going. You're right. Like yeah, you're so okay. right. I'm not selling fifty million dollar homes, but yeah. you're like, I know exactly. So like, what you're usually, about. like the the way the way I always sell. Uh, Funny enough, whenever I get like a pocket listing or something like that, and I call my network of like high net worth guys, I've never called a guy and said like, hey, by the way, I think you should buy this or this is for you. I always call them up and say like, who do you know that would want this really awesome thing? You know, so it's like, and they're like, how come not for me? <laughs> you know, but you would never like, I would never tell them like, I got the perfect house for you. No, it's like, he's like, oh my God, I'm like super excited. I'm like, Joe, you don't understand this listing I got. It's not on the market. It's amazing. It's three acres. It's 50 million, whatever, whatever. It's like, Tell me that like, you must know someone that would want this, you know? So immediately one, you're like playing a little bit of like, mind. Don't weed me out. Right. You're, not, <laughs> you're not like, how come well, and if they don't want it, you weed that out really fast. Cause they're yeah. not like, if they don't want yeah. it, it's going to bypass yeah. it. Without, so, there's a couple right. things. Uh, so one of the things I discovered early on that, that Carlos did funny enough is that we never advertise. We don't spend money. We don't, we don't farm areas. I know it works and I know people do it. I don't yeah. farm. I don't advertise. I don't send flyers. I don't do magazines. When I get listings, I don't do mailers, et cetera, et cetera. It just simply in my train, in my training, it didn't work. So I go in actually for my P and L or my profit and loss statement. When I get a listing of what I did to spend, I know a lot of our friends spend a lot of money in advertising. A lot of our agents spend Fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars a month, and it does work if you buy every single magazine over and over and over. But you better be committed, and you better be committed when you do that to spend the money, and you better be committed to have a big team because that's going to bring you a lot of business. And with that, you start analyzing smartly, though, because I can do hundred million dollars in transactions, but my profit is huge. I can have more profit in hundred million dollars in transactions than a team that's doing a billion dollars, no, not a billion, but let's say $500 million in sales, but they have assistants and showing agents and administrators, and they have an advertising budget of you know $150,000 a month because they buy every single magazine and they mail out to 5,000. It's, it's true. My, 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 my whatchamacallit is a lot more efficient. My, my profit and loss is, is right. way more efficient. There you go. Yeah. You know, yeah. My old accounting background, but really what uh, ultimately... Yeah, listen. And I want to remind a lot of the things you're saying, I just got to reinforce, like you we're talking like you're top in the, not just the city, but the country yeah. using this approach. This isn't just somebody like, well, this is my definition of success. Yeah, it's yours, but it's other people's too. And it works. Yeah. The other thing that, that I really did that, um, I, I was also Carlos based, which is really my entire, let's say, feeder network one obviously is is from other realtors around the country that that value me because ultimately sending a referral out when it's someone really really important one thing is sending a referral that's a you know million dollar referral to i don't know where you're like who cares who gets it you know it doesn't matter but if it's your let's say if it's someone in new york city who has a 10 million dollar 20 million dollar potential referral to come to miami are you going to send it to the general office and just have it go to a an assigned agent that you have no idea is like, hell no, these are my clients. You know, I want to make sure who's going to take care of them. So I end up being, I receive a lot of really good referrals simply from other agents simply because they know who I am and they know it's going to be handled super professionally because of my ethics. And You're my not going to say you like it, you want to make an offer. Yeah. So that, that was really good. So that doing this ethics and right. Yeah. Yeah. So doing this system works for referrals because more and more in the higher end because higher end referrals aren't going to go to the, your, your general Atlanta office and they get assigned by the manager. No, they get handpicked by the referral agent in Las Vegas who's sending it to Atlanta and they know exactly it's going to Jerry because she's the person who's going to personally take care of my client. So it's very dangerous. To, I, I don't send a referral out to anywhere unless I know where it's going. And I vet the people who I'm going to refer it to. I want to make sure it's in the right personality, the right everything. So that's number one. And number two is how really the rest of my business, funny enough, is all based on when I first started real estate, I was, I, I was very good friends with one of the top producing bankers here from Goldman Sachs. And I've said that story a few times before. And when you analyze our business, if you're in the investment banking business, if you're a money manager at a very high level, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, whatever it is, do you ever see, and I always make fun of this, do you ever see your local Goldman Sachs banker sending you a flyer to your house saying like, 
call me, bank with me, or whatever. Picture him and his Ferrari, like with his watch, with his freaking, you know, Rolex, like, hey man, call me, I'll take care of you. No, you know, this is like Goldman Sachs bankers, you know, people that work for McKenzie, if you're a consultant, people that work for, you know, a top, if you're a divorce attorney or an injury attorney, maybe not so, but if you're one of the top corporate lawyers, they don't send flyers like, hey, you want to do mergers and acquisitions? Call me, you know, whatever. So basically what I did is like, you, I, I spent some time with the guy and I'm like, how do you get your business? And it's ultimately, it's all based on, if you think of like a hub and spoke system, where you have the principal in the middle and you say, who touches that guy? And you say like, the accountant does, the banker does, the yacht broker does, the airplane broker does, the realtor does, the, all these people does. So there's a whole level, a whole circle of service providers that have this principle's trust. So the question is, I need to be friends with those service providers. And those service providers need to know me, they need to like me, and they need to know that if they ever refer me, that I am not just a sales guy, that I'm not a you know, Toyota sales guy that I'm not just a, Hey, call me. Yeah. Like, you know, my whatever. So it's like, so it's, you're working at the big leagues. This is, again, you're trying to get to that $20 million referral, $30 million referral. And so the same thing I said about don't give up on your potential buyers. Also work that, work that circle of service providers locally. It could be Atlanta. It could be, and this doesn't have to be the 20 million. It could be a 10 million. It could be a 5 million. It could be a 2 million. Everybody has a certain level of service providers. Stay in touch with them. Those guys three, four times a year. Hey, Peter, what are you doing? You want to have lunch? Hey, so-and-so you want to have lunch? Hey, so-and-so spend the time, put them in a bucket. I always say the bucket of your sphere of influence is the same CRM that most people have or whatever you have, whatever system you use, doesn't really matter. Get 50 people, a hundred people max. You can't have, oh, I have a database of 20,000 people. It's bullshit. That's, that's, it's useless. Uh, yeah, I don't have, I don't mail out to 20,000 people because it, uh, it's, that's not my business. But anyways, but find a hundred people. You can make a great business with 200 really qualified people, 200 bankers, lawyers, accountants, CPAs, be friendly with them. They have to trust you. You have to trust them. Don't be a taker, taker, taker. You know, call the CPA and say, Hey, I want to introduce you to this immigration attorney because he's great. Take them both out to breakfast prove value, give back. Don't just be that guy who's always like, give me a referral. Hey, you got a referral? Hey, you got a referral for me? You got a, it's like, dude, I don't love you. it's like, Keep so going. like yeah. annoying that, that yeah. annoying realtor always asking for referrals. No, just yeah. like know people that trust you and like you add value, introduce them to other people that also will benefit their business. Talk to the, to the trust attorney. He's like, what are you doing? What can I help you with? And then maybe help them with a business or a client. You add value. It's all part of the karma thing or whatever it is. Perfect story, Jerry. I'll tell you seven years with this trust attorney here in Miami. Um, most people would have given up. I knew the guy was awesome. Twice a year, went out to lunch, hang out, whatever. Most people that I know, realtors, if they follow that high intensity thing would be like, this guy sucks. You know, it's been three years. He hasn't thrown me a lead. I'm moving to the next guy. I don't have time for this guy. He's not throwing me leads. No, maybe he's testing you one. Maybe he wants you to, to really understand you before he truly trusts you to be able to deliver his clients because to, to refer someone is extremely dangerous. If I refer yeah. someone and they, and he's my valued client, I don't even like to refer landscape people. I give you like, here's four people, choose one. Because if you refer someone bad, it's, it's on you. Like, oh, you referred me to that loser guy who like jit exactly. or whatever. So anyway, so seven years go by, Jerry. All of a sudden, I get this one call from Hal. And he goes like, Jorge, so-and-so is going to call you. And I'm like, who is that? Oh, it's Billy Joel's attorney. And I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah. So I got a call from Billy Joel's attorney from New York. And he goes, he said, like, Hal recommended you. You're the guy. Billy, you want to sell his house in Lagos? Just send us a proposal. So I sent him a proposal. I sent him a really nice presentation. Here's the CMA. This is what I would sell for whatever. And he goes, great. Send me a listing presentation and that's it. I didn't have to compete against the Jills or whatever, all these other leaves or guys and all this stuff because it, it came recommended from a guy that they trusted. So they didn't say like, Jorge, show us your marketing plan. Are you going to spend, are you going to spend $20,000 in flyers and all this other stuff? No, they knew I know what I'm talking about. So my, uh, one of the things I've always done too, sorry if I'm scattering conversation, Jerry. No, you're not. But one of the things that I've always done to, to disarm uh, 
you know, when people tell me like, I want you to spend $5,000 in magazines. And I'd be like, listen, it's not a matter of money because I have money. I'm doing it. I'm just here to help you. I would rather, I would rather you give me like your wife's favorite charity, save the whales, the elephants, and I'll write you a check right now instead of sending it to those fucking magazines that are useless. So that's usually how, how I, and that, that's usually how I end up disarming them. I'm just like, just give me a charity. I'll write the check. I just don't want to waste advertising. I don't want to, if we start a relationship no. fooling each other, like if we start, if, if I tell you that magazines doesn't sell your house is because I believe it doesn't because I get money if I sell it, obviously. Uh, now, if I go in with the premise, like most realtors saying like, I'm going to sell your house because I got all these flyers and all this other stuff. They're lying to you. So they're going on with the premise that those magazines and those flyers is to sell themselves, is to get listings. It's not to sell the property. So if they go in, so it's funny, I've done it before. I've got, I got a really big listing that I said, I bet you the next agent that comes in the door is going to walk in here with a stack of magazines and she's going to plop them on the table and she's going to be like, this is what I'm going to do for you, Mr. Seller. And the guy called me up like the next day. He's like, it's so funny. The lady showed up with a stack of magazines. And I was like, <laughs> you called it. And I said, yeah. I said, that person is not going to sell your property. It's selling themselves. It's to get more listings. So it's like they're being disingenuous to begin with. I mean, I do advertise in magazines too, by the way. No, stop advertising. No, but it works for you. But don't, don't say it's to sell their properties. The advertising in magazine is to get your business running and it works. Right. I'm Magazine right. advertising and farming an area works. Just choose your poison. I love it. If you go that business route, I'm telling you about the way I do business, which is a little bit I different. I love this. Yeah. No, but it's brilliant. I love it. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's an agent down there somewhere, and I forgot his name, but like, I think he like, pays to keep his picture if, off the internet or something. I don't know. We don't need to bring up his name, but anyway, I know he's, I don't even know him, but he does like, he's in your sphere. And we're not going to say his name because we need to know about Jorge Uribe. Wait, Jorge Uribe. Yeah. Is that it? Jorge Uribe. Yeah. Jorge Uribe. That's pretty good for like. That's very good for a green guys. Not bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love you. Okay. So going into all that. So now we, we've gone from getting get into the business. Like you're like a corporate guy doing, you know, being the good guy, doing your job. Now you're with these meditators that are super <laughs> intense. You get your territory, but you've got to know like the listing about it before it ever hits. Like talk about an accountability program. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a genius. It, it was called the, the, the sales engine, basically, which was basically. The pressure of I that just, was like, was there any anxiety where you're like. Oh, like, totally. No, but you, right? you, but you could, you could actually do that. Um, as practice, you could actually choose someone in your, in your office that you can kind of like be accountable to each other. You know, it's good to be accountable yeah. to because there's a lot of solo I operators. It. I happen to be a solo person. It's me and an assistant. I've never really had a team. Um, I've never really played with teams. Um, it just, I didn't want to, just uh, my mental, I just couldn't deal with dealing with people more yeah, people I get responsible it. for. But, but the, the tough thing is in this business is being accountable. And, and that accountability thing, Carlos really had it ingrained in us um, where you should know, you should not be lazy. You shouldn't sit on your laurels. Uh, you should know your market um, and, and, and make the calls. It's all a numbers game. Make the calls, make the meetings, go out. Um, and, and you have to be mentally prepared to face rejection and face, you know, people hanging up and, you know, whatever, but it's okay. It's yeah, so have the market knowledge, have the habits and have the mind. Yep. It's really like, uh, like, the not like we are, and the mind is really difficult. The mind is a really difficult thing. We also, um, simple little things that you can do, um, you know, before you go to that listing presentation, you know, the thing that's going to be going through your mind, especially if it's a really competitive situation is, you know, who else is going there? My arch nemesis is going to be interviewing there. And you go in there with already with some sort of a, you know, level of insecurity in your head. So your, your head is really what your head is doing is your head is protecting you from rejection. Your ego is frail. Everybody's ego is frail. Anybody who says they're not is lying. Everybody, we all want to be accepted. It's in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We all want to belong. We all want to be accepted. So going to a listening presentation, whether it's a listening presentation or you're presenting an offer to a client, you know, it's very important to just sit in your car five minutes before you walk in, shut the radio off, calm music, relax, 
have a winning attitude. You know, Carlos would go through this whole, you know, we listen to Eckhart Tolle power now all day long in the car instead of listening to like, you know, crappy it. Fox News or CNN or whatever, just yeah, bad, bad negative, negative, negative. No, it was all positive, positive, positive. But we would sit in the car after Eckhart, two minutes, shut your eyes and just basically basic meditation is imagine you walk in the room, you open up the door, you say hello to your client. Imagine what it would feel like giving him the listening presentation. Imagine you kick ass. Imagine him signing it. How does that make you feel? Blah, 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 blah. But what you're doing is like, why would a guy like Carlos, who is now a master, this guy is like a genius, 30 year, super successful, but he would do it every single time. Every single time we would go to a listening presentation. Self-fulfilling prophecy too. It's just self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, it, it creates your mind. Yeah, but, it's like, but I, 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 I compare it the same way with like, why does Tiger Woods practice six hours a day if he's already a good golfer, right? It's like, <laughs> because... These guys, it's psychological, it's mechanical, it's their thing. They're, 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 they're top performing athletes at their top of the game. LeBron, anybody, anybody who's any sport or anything is constantly practicing and practicing and practicing. What do we got to practice? We got to practice is really our heads. Our heads are the only muscle that will make us successful or not. If we have crap and insecurity. So even, even, even for an athlete like Tony Robbins, you know, we're going to... Oh, yeah, no. The athletes be, have, I mean, oh my God. Tony Robbins used to coach athletes who had knew nothing about their sport, but yeah. he knew it was in their head to get them to break through. And athletes athletes are worse. We actually got it much easier. I think we got we got it way easier than an athlete because an athlete's got to, he's got to deal with what we got to deal with, which is just the mind, which is super complex. But then now they got to deal with the whole muscle. And perform and, and swing and audience and all this other stuff. We just got to deal with what the athletes got to deal with in their mind. Like, you know, hey, the game, you're losing the game. What happens? You adversity, rejection, you're letting people down, all these mental stuff that athletes have in their head. That So we just have the head part. So we have less excuse to perform worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, it's actually easier. So really, we should always practice, you know, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of, you need to be in a good place mentally. You need to be in a good place physically. You need to be in a good place, uh, you know, food wise, what you eat, don't eat crap, don't eat a lot of, you know, whatever, be in a good place. Hopefully in a relationship that's in a good place, um, you know, a happy marriage, a happy relationship, a, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend. obviously it's, it, these are all things because ultimately these are all external factors that will affect you. These are all external factors that, um, that won't make you perform. If you if you just got into a fight with your boyfriend, girlfriend, a significant other, whoever, your kids, and you go into a prison and you've had all this, Wah! there's no way you can go into this, you know, and fire in all cylinders, you know? And, and to know that, and not, don't BS yourself about it. Like, you yeah. really have to get it right. Like, don't be like, no, I'm fine. Mm -mm. No, you have to truly, you have to really. I mean, I've had a couple of people like, I mean, I've been kind of really blunt with a lot of people that have come to my office here in Miami and be like, their realtors were struggling and they come to me and they're like, Jorge, you know, you got to help me. I'm dying over here. And I'm like, can I give you some advice? Get out of real estate right now. Just get out of real estate. Go find yourself a job. Take care of yourself. Take care of your finances. The way you are right now, you're just digging yourself a bigger hole, bigger hole, bigger hole. You're going to hell. I mean, this is like a plane that there's no way you can pull up. All you can do is just, if you're in that position that you're about to lose your house or whatever it is or whatever, and you're like in a really bad place, take a break from real estate, just get out. Because this is the wrong profession to be in if you're in a bad place psychologically or financially. Um, go find a job, it's okay to, listen, I have, I've sold cars in Cayocho, I've worked as a busboy, I mean, there's no shame in work and there's not, I've done everything, I've done landscaping, I've done mold remediation, I've just, you know, but work was work. Go find another job, there's always something you could do, work at a mall, work, but just, you know, just help gets healthy again and then come into real estate because real estate is a place that your mind will, oof. Exactly. We are, I mean, I talk about like a character building career. Yeah. All right. We've got to, we're going to edit. We've got to pause for just a minute because I'm going to just, oh no, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Um, because edit, I'm going to do an edit thing. So, all right, edit five, four, three, two, one. No, I mean, this business, honestly, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's been the best thing in the world. I mean, it is really an amazing, um, job done correctly. Right. So, I mean, 
it's a fantasy job in reality. I mean, you, it's a fantasy job in that if, if you find yourself in a place that you work with clients that like you and respect you, you make a really good living. You're making a difference. I mean, you're really helping people in something that's exciting and fun. I mean, this is like, you know, their home. I've sold lots and now are built and I get mails like, you know, from clients saying like, you know, this has been, you know, this is so awesome, Jorge, thank you for finding this. I've had clients that say, I want to move to a condo and I'm like, no, you don't. I want to sell you this house. And I, because I know better and I move them and now they keep selling me like, thank God you made me buy this house. And you've influenced people's lives. You've gotten good money. You meet every day, you meet someone super interesting, super like mm -hmm. badass, who's done really well, who's, and then you're sharing an intimate moment with people that are really interesting. I mean, think how blessed we are with some of these, you know, superstar people or whatever, yeah, whoever, it doesn't matter whoever they are, that you're spending intimate time with people and they're telling you about their life, their kids, and then you get them in a the house, you get paid and now you've, versus when I work corporate, listen, I was in finance and you're like, they're like all day doing the same thing, the same clients, the same, you know, it's like you get your paycheck and it's like, yeah, you know, pulling the pulling the mm -hmm. cog yeah, every day, like Instagram. year after year after year. Like now it's like every day is like a different client, a different house, a different something. So it's it's really, you know. It, and you're it, learning and building character, by the way. You're learning. And then you, I learned so much from being in a, in, a, in, a, in a car with someone who sold a company. And I'm like, it also helps to come back from, I mean, to have, I guess maybe it helps me to have my business background when I'm like, you know, how did you start the business? Tell me about it or whatever. I mean, yeah. it, I mean you can have that conversation. It's awesome. It really is like you're, you're having intimate moments with the guy sold a $49 million house. A lot of people in the world would want to have breakfast with him because he's just super like, you know, billionaire guy that, and now you spend hours and hours with these people, just knowing them as human beings. It's really, and you get paid obscene amounts of money for doing so. No, I'm kidding. But exactly. It's a lot of hard work, but it's good. Yeah. I mean, like, it's just like literally like frame things for yourself a little. So final three questions we enter we end every interview with us. Question right. one, what have you found is your most powerful resource or tool in being a successful agent? Um, for sure. I'm going to split that one in two. Uh, knowledge and mental control, just being in a happy place mentally. People really want to be around me because I don't say I'm like a happy guy, but I'm just a calm, relaxed, like yeah. grown up, grown up in the room. So that's been very helpful for my mind, having a, a steady place in my mind. I love that. Cause like this whole interview has been about that. And of course, then I'm going to like slip in number three habits. Yeah. But with knowledge and mental mind, yeah. you get habits. Okay. Next one book. If there's one book we've just got to read, that's life-changing for our business or life or yours. What is that book? Um, I was going to the secret. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's the secret. No. When that book came out. My sister would go, shh. Yeah. Anyway, um, go the book. Audiobooks. I don't read uh, audiobooks. I mean, I've heard every single Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Eckhart the, power, the Power of Now for me was life changing. I mean, it was really. The was Power of awesome. Now. That's it. Did you read is that the, the Awake? Is it the um, Awake? Now I don't even know, but I listened. It's his. I actually just listened to him. I didn't read it. I just, uh, his audio. I listened book, I mean, to it, but his, was, his, his voice is just so awesome. Yeah, anyways. I love his voice. <laughs> he's like that, that German. He's like so long <laughs> home. But what is the Awake? The Awake? The. Something about being awake. The other book, have you listened? I'm going to send it to you. The Power of Now, but the other one, I'll you'll love it. It actually, something about it makes me laugh, even though it's serious. It's just, it's a, I don't know, just, it's, it's okay. insane, but very, very enlightening at the same time. Last thing, if there's anything that you would have us remember, if we just forget everything else from this interview, what is it? Or conversation, I really should say. Um... If there's one thing that you could remember from this interview, um, just integrity. I mean, just be a person of integrity uh, and be always thinking of your client's best interest way before yourself. I am so unattached to my own personal needs and I'm all about service, service, service. I mean, I'm just like brainwashed about servicing. Maybe it's cultural too. Keep in mind that Colombians, not to like boast about our culture. We do. The Ritz and the Four Seasons always hires Colombian waiters because Colombian people, their pleasure in serving, like in, in Spanish, we have a, say, a saying in Colombia, with con mucho gusto means with much, like I'm like super happy to serve you, like a Colombian waiter in a restaurant. And it's all based on, it's a cultural thing of service, like excellence of service. Um, yeah. it's, it's, maybe it's cultural, but I, I truly, I truly love it. 
That's yeah, I truly live, I, yeah, I truly live excellence of service. And it's and it's all based on like like just the client's happiness and best interest before yourself. Like if it means staying up late or getting today, I was at six in the morning because a guy wanted to see a sunrise and I was there. I woke up at five 30, went on just to make the guy happy. I could have made up anyways, but I'm just about service, 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 service. go the extra mile and service. That was, that I would say. Jorge, Jorge Uribe. In my 